If you have your Bibles, you can open up to Psalms 96, uh, is where we're going to be spending some time today. And uh, excited to, to teach uh, this morning. We uh, we're walking into 2023, and if you were here with us uh, a couple or a month or two ago, we, we had a series where we had the overseers of our church come in. And uh, what that uh, provided for was uh, a month for me to work on some, some other tasks. Uh, it wasn't time off. It just was time not preaching. And uh, one of the, 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 the tasks that uh, I championed and looked at and prayed into uh, was planning out all of the teaching for 2023. Uh, where is God leading us? What do we want to talk about as a church? Where do we need to focus on? Where, where do we feel like God leading us to, to grow? And uh, as uh, preparing that and considering what we're going to talk about uh, over the course of this year, uh, I was reminded of a phrase that... Uh, when we were in the earliest stages of planting a church, we wrote out some values. It wasn't really cleanly stated yet what specifically our core values were, but like what, what do we feel like God is calling us to build? What are some of the focuses or practices we want to incorporate before the ball gets rolling and we're kind of caught up in the way things are? Like what do we want to create uh, in the way things are as a church? And uh, one of the statements that uh, uh, was written down that was just uh, brought to my mind was uh, a phrase that simply said that the culture that is built is more important or more powerful than the, the sermons that are preached. Um, and, and let me explain this a little bit. Uh, I don't want to devalue the preaching of God's word at all. It is so important and powerful. And what we are called to do consistently as we gather together is to teach the word of God. And we do it every time that we get together. And I'm not devaluing it at all. But over the course of time, as a church community, what is more powerful than a single sermon that is preached, although so much uh, energy can go into that, is the culture that's created. We have a desire to be a healthy church, a church that is growing in maturity, a church that uh, is throughout the week reading their Bible and worshiping, and, and a church that uh, is pursuing holiness and that is healthy and can last for a long time. Like We talk about all this a lot. Really, you could look at our seven core values that are in that welcome booklet, and uh, it kind of defines more clearly the culture that we build. We believe God is calling us to build. And when we have a culture, a community of people where this is normative, that culture carries so much power and so much more momentum versus just trying to intellectually teach certain principles. And so with, with that being said, um, I really felt like going into to this year, the reality is that if, if culture is so important to us, we're going to find ourselves revisiting cultural concepts that are important to our community, that we're going to continue to go back and we're going to talk about core values as consistently as we can. Um, that uh, not just occasionally are we going to revisit these, but it should be something like if culture is that important to us that we're going to hit on, we're going to talk about with some level of consistency. And, uh, and hopefully we, we present it in ways that uh, maybe are, are new and novel and perspectives and helping us grow in these areas. But we want to uh, consistently go back to the values that we believe God has called us to and, uh, and teach on them consistently. One reason we have Bible reading plans available to you is because we want to be a church that uh, is familiar with the Word of God. Our first core value is, is the Bible, that we anchor ourselves to tr the truth of God's Word. We truly believe that it transforms us into the image of its author. Like, if we believe that, we ought to be talking and presenting opportunities of how do we engage with Scripture, not just somebody teaching from a stage, but how do we as a body do that? We want to encourage as much as we can ways to engage with the culture that we value. Uh, one of our values values that we're going to talk about specifically today is, is worship. Uh, we say it uh, this way, we put prayer and worship together, and the way that we say it as a church is, he is worthy. Like, we could probably list a hundred ways or reasons why we would pray or why we would worship, but it all boils down to this. We serve a God who is worthy of all of it, all of the attention, all the adoration, all the affection, all of the, the communication that he is worthy. Uh, we, we don't worship as a church, and if we talk about uh, the corporate setting, like we just experienced, like we're, we're in this moment right now, uh, we don't come together and, and have the band do what they do and have the lyrics on the screen and all the setup that goes into this. We don't do this because we like the songs or because it's enjoyable to listen to a band. Like those may be elements that are true, but why we do what we do, it's because he's worthy. He's worthy of us creating opportunities and atmospheres and settings to declare together how amazing he is. That he is to be worshipped, he is to be honored, and so we create these atmospheres. I want to make it clear that worship is uh, not for our entertainment. It's not. It, worship, what we experience when we come together, is, is opportunities for us to declare the worthiness of God because he is worthy. And so we want to be a church that consistently is engaged in prayer and engaged in worship. Um, now, certainly, we want to create the most 
engaging atmospheres for you to declare the worthiness of God. And so we want excellence in our setup. We want excellence in the band and the vocals and the presentation of lyrics on screens. Like we want this to be as accessible as possible for even those who are not uh, familiar or, or have been distant from engaging in settings like this. We want it as engaging as we can, but the goal of engagement is not so that you can uh, get your cup of coffee, sit back, and observe what's happening around. Like, what we're trying to do is create environments where we can live out the value of expressing the worthiness of God. Uh, if you're taking notes, you can write this down. I, I, I truly believe that worship demands expression. Worship demands expression. Uh, if we consider anything that we care about, anything that we value, anything that we admire, anything that we love, uh, when that is true, it pulls an expression out of us. If there is a person, somebody that you love, someone you care about, someone you admire, it pulls out of you expressions, whether it is speaking those love and admiration to them. It is the way that you spend your time. It's the way that you spend your money. It's your emotional ups and downs are related to engagement with this individual. Uh, maybe you are a sport sports fan. And uh, if you care about a team, it begins to express itself. Maybe uh, the colors of shirts that you're wearing, the logos that are on your hats, like we begin to express that way. Uh, any of you uh, find yourself emotionally engaged in whether that team of people wins or loses? It's embarrassing how much it can make my day or ruin my day if some people I don't even know will never know I exist if they do well or not. We can be emotionally engaged because we care about them. We'll spend our time our, our schedules will be adapted to when game time is, when kickoff is, because that is an expression of something that we care about. We could go down example, example after example. Uh, anything, any hobby you have, if you like to cook, if you like to fish, it's going to impact your time, your energy, your thoughts, your emotions, your expressions. Because when we care about something, if it is true, if it's genuinely internally something that we admire and love, it will be expressed. And so when it comes to our relationship with God, if there is a genuine affection for, love, commitment to, that, that will be expressed. And those expressions are forms of worship. I want to make it clear that as we talk a little bit about expressions of worship, um, worship's not defined by the outward expression, by the raising of hands, by the singing, by whatever we're going to label. That, that, that doesn't define worship. What defines worship is the recognition internally of the worthiness of God and the expression of that. So when we talk about expressions of worship, we're not saying worship is these things. We're saying worship is that admiration of God, and he has designed ways for us to express that worship. Loving a team isn't wearing the hat. Wearing the hat is an expression of loving the team. And so as we talk about worship, it is, hey, I've got this growing relationship, affection for God. I admire, I see the gospel at work, and how does that come out? How is that expressed in my life? Uh, I also want to say before we talk about specific expressions that there are some people who are just naturally more expressive than other people. Some, uh, some people in their volume, some people in their physical expressions, you are just a much more expressive person than other people in the room. There are some people that walk in these doors and you see somebody that you saw seven days ago, but you are so excited to see them. You just love them. It's amazing to see them that there is volume. Ah! It's so good to see you. And there is hugs and there's like this emotional moment. I just, I, it's always so good to see you. How was your week? What happened with this, with that? Like there's just this, this drawing out of expression. Uh, and you, it hasn't been that long, but you just love this person so much. There's other people. Well, you're walking in this room and you will see someone you haven't seen for years and you really like them. You really appreciate them. It means a lot that you see them and you're actually excited and your expression is, and that's good. Some of you are one of those and married to the opposite and you don't understand each other. Like, why do we have to talk to everybody that is even familiar to you and then some when it could just be like, oh, hello. And you can go get lunch afterwards. Like, you, there's, there's a, a, maybe a not understanding of each other because some of us are just more expressive and engaging in opportunities like that than other people. But it's true, those expressions are true for each. I want to say when it comes to expressing our worship of God, we're different than each other. 
And so this is not going to be a teaching on everybody must express the same exact way. I think that would be uh, forced and that would be uh, disingenuous if your worship is just doing what somebody else does because that's the way that their expression is. Uh, John chapter 4, Jesus says he is looking for a people that will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. I think an application of what Jesus is saying there is you're going to worship in a way that is genuine. It's not going to be fake. It's not going to be forced. It's going to be a way that is genuine for the way that God designed you. So if you are a more expressive person, uh, you don't get to look down on those that are less expressive and be like, man, they just must not love the Lord as much as me. Maybe they don't understand the gospel as well as I do because if they did, their hands would be a little bit higher. Uh, we don't get to do that. On the other end, if you are less expressive, we don't get to look at the people that are more expressive and be like, wow, they want attention. Uh, they're so loud. They don't realize how off key they are in this moment. But uh, we, don't get to, we don't get to determine what is spirit and truth for each other. I also want to say those that are less reserved or the, the, that are more reserved, less expressive, I, I don't want to say that uh, by default that means you don't get to engage because you just don't like to engage as much. I, from the very beginning, you go back to Genesis, whenever worship is talked about, worship always includes sacrifice. Sacrifice, by definition, is uncomfortable. So I, I do want to say that so what is spirit, what is true, doesn't mean that uh, we don't say, we, it's not just about me now. Well, this is how I like, this is what's comfortable for me. It's saying like, what is genuinely expressing my love for this God? What does that look like in the way that he designed me? And how do we take steps forward in expressing the worthiness of God? So the question I just want to pose, and we're going to look at just a couple very simple ways this morning, is how do we, how do we express worship of God? If there is this admiration, this affection, and the way that God has designed me, what does it look like in a setting like this to express the worthiness of God? Um, today, we're going to talk about ways to express God's worthiness, ways to worship God vocally, with our mouths, verbally. It's not the only way, but we're going to look at these in Psalms 96. Uh, outlines for us uh, a couple of ways that we can express worship of God with our mouths, with words. Um, there's great power in our words. We all know that uh, there's power in words. And words are one of the most prominent ways that we get to express what's going on in our hearts. That what we're feeling, what, what we're deciding, what we're struggling with, good or bad, the way that we e most easily get what's going on on the inside to the outside is through honest language. It's, it's verbally. We communicate it to somebody in some setting. Uh, it's the way that we get out what's in our hearts. Uh, words matter. We also... Uh, quickly learn that it's not just what words are stated, but how those words are said that really matters. Like not just the, the words came out, but the expression of them, the volume, the tone, the tenor, the intensity, it, it all matters. It impacts, uh, which is uh, the, the, the downfall of, of, of communication that is, is text, that is email. Like we all know that uh, the, the downfall is, well, I don't get to, I can see what was said, but I don't get how it was said because there's power in both. Uh, how many of you guys uh, have gotten that text message where you're not sure how to interpret it? Is this good or is this bad? Uh, it could be both. I, I, I'm having to determine right now because it's not, I don't know how it was said. We have learned with a teenage daughter that if the word okay is sent to you with a punctuation at the end, with a period, always bad news. Uh, <laughs> parents of teenagers, punctuation is bad. You don't want it. I know we're supposed to encourage it. Don't. Uh, if it's okay and it's just Empty at the end of it, good news. Uh, period, bad news. Uh, or maybe you've even just got a text message like, great. Well, is this great or is this great? You know, you don't know. Like, or you get the, 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 the scary one of like, uh, please call me when the meeting's over. Hmm. <laughs> What is this going to be? Uh, this could be super exciting. This could be devastating. Like there's that tension because it's not just what was said. It was how it was said. And with text messages, the ever-changing landscape of the emoji game is really hard. I just try to stay away from it entirely because I don't get it. I read an article recently that um, uh, Gen Z, the younger generation, is like writing off and canceling and labeling some emojis as boomer emojis because it's not cool anymore. Uh, I don't mean to wreck your guys' lives, but I just read that uh, the thumbs up emoji is now passive aggressive. It doesn't mean good anymore. Like, how does this not mean I'm excited about what you just said? Uh, it, it's, they, the, the Gen Z doesn't like it. You gotta have praise hands or something. I don't know, no more thumbs up unless you mean bad. Uh, it's, it's confusing. We so often are challenged not by just what was said, but how it was said. 
that's the concept I want to take into Psalm 96 here, is certainly we can understand that certain language, certain words, certain expressions verbally are good, but it gives us not just instruction on what to say. In fact, we're not going to see a lot of instruction on what to say. There's a lot of examples in Scripture of what good things to say in worship or prayer are, but what we focus on here is how do you say what's going on internally? Uh, let's look at Psalms uh, 96 here. It says uh, in verse 1, sing a new song to the Lord. Let the whole earth sing to the Lord. Sing to the Lord. Praise his name. Uh, I think we could say maybe it's obvious now what the first expression with our mouth is. And it's, it's singing. I know some people aren't very comfortable singing. And certainly not in a public setting. Singing is, is more challenging. Like it's not something that maybe fits your comfort zone. But it is pretty clear that it says sing three different times in this one verse and 86 times in the Psalms we're commanded to uh, that we're going to take the word of God seriously. We maybe need to consider this instruction seriously. And it says all the earth, not those with good voices, not those with musical training, not those who are really comfortable putting themselves out there in front of other people. It's, it's everybody is called to sing to the Lord. Not just what you're saying, but how you say it matters. And we are called to express his worthiness. Point number one, if you're a note taker today, we can worship God by singing. We can express the worthiness of God through singing. Not just stating words, but by singing them. Singing is found all throughout the Bible. So many times when some, God moves in a mighty way, the response is the people sing a song or they write a song or they just tell the story of what just happened, but they put it to melody and they get people with instruments and, and they, they take what God did and they turn it into song all throughout scripture. Genesis to the end of Revelation, God is a musical God and a singing God and he loves to, for worship to be expressed expressed to him through song. Uh, you can see uh, not just in the Old Testament, in the Psalms, in the New Testament, there's commands for the New Testament church to be a singing church. You can find commands in James and Ephesians that when you gather, you are to be a singing church. You can see stories of Jesus and the disciples singing hymns together. Thirteen grown men with beards, with no instruments, just going a cappella before dinner. Kind of awkward. <laughs> there's no way all of them sounded good. But they, this was what it meant to be together with brothers in the faith is that some of what we do is we don't just talk, we sing together the declarations of who God is, his character and what he's doing in our lives. So some of why we come together on a Sunday morning and whenever we get together, why music is so consistently a part of what we do is because we are commanded all throughout scripture that a way to express our worship of God is through song. Um, I think maybe a question is, is why? why? Why song? Why singing? One, it's biblical, but if we think about it, um, there's so much power in song. There's so much power in music. Some of you have songs of nostalgia where as soon as it comes on, it takes you back to a certain spot, a certain time, a certain place, a certain person, a certain emotion. Like music can just transport us. It just, it carries so much power when a concept is put into, into song. Uh, I know for me, uh, I bought one ringtone ever in my life. Remember when that was a thing? You could shop through your little flip phone, 99 cents, and I was like, yeah, kind of steep. Uh, <laughs> I bought one ringtone my whole life, and uh, it was Brown Eyed Girl, so that whenever Danny called me when we were dating, Van Morrison started singing Brown Eyed Girl. Oh my goodness, that was, a, I didn't expect that, that was sweet. That is so sweet. <laughs> Still to this day, we'll be anywhere in public, Brown Eyed Girl comes on, it's just like, oh, it just stirs up, like, get over here, cutie, you're gonna give me a little kiss. Like, it stirs something up because it just has meaning. You probably all have something where it transports you to some place because it's music has a certain power. Um, have you noticed that sometimes, of course you've noticed, we will play certain music intentionally to put us in certain moods. Like we want to feel a certain way, we want a certain outlook, and so we have different playlists to get us into certain mindsets, certain moods. Easiest is your workout, your, your pump up mix, your pregame mix to get these things going, you know, you get excited about it. Uh, you maybe you got your study mix or your, your, your cool down mix, whatever it is. Um, this one is, is strange to me, and I'm as guilty as anyone else. We will feel a little bit sad, and so we will play sad songs to make us feel more sad. <laughs> what is wrong with us? Some of you right now, you could pull out your phones and pull out a playlist, name something super sappy that is only for when you feel sad or you want to feel sad. Like you have the, that you've got that emotional playlist. We, we do these things because music can transport our outlook, 
on what is about to happen, for good or for bad, it can, cha- it can transition the way that we're thinking, the way that we're looking, simply through music. Um, I've done this with a, a lot of different songs, and it's a fun game, but to consider lyrics of songs without music, like songs that like pack meaning and just like get something out of you and then strip the music away, and it's just ridiculous, the things that get us really excited. Um, we could do a thousand different songs, but I prepared one for you. I'm not going to, just stating these lyrics. This is going to move some of you. Is this the real life? Is this just fantasy? Oh, some of you are already going. Caught in a landslide. No escape from reality. What are we talking about? Open your eyes. Look up to the skies and see. Some of you right now just, I'm just a poor boy. I don't know. No, it's great. I don't know what it is. But you, I read through all of the lyrics of Bohemian Rhapsody and was like, I don't know what we're talking about here. (laughs) But it comes on, and I mean, it is just the road trip song. It's just like something pulls out of us because when you take nonsense and you put it to music, it's power. When you take something of meaning and put it to music, all of a sudden there's incredibly more power. And what is is something else to notice about why music, why singing, is have you ever noticed that uh, certainly there is power in song by itself and power in song in the headphones, but the power of song in community. Maybe you remember the, the bus rides with the team back in high school or the carpooling or uh, road tripping across the country or uh, maybe it's even in a stadium or a gymnasium full of people. And when that song comes on, something happens. What is it with Sweet Caroline? I don't know. Even our little seven-year-old Finley, this song was written decades before he was born, loves to just scream, oh, oh, oh. And there's something like you got arms around somebody you don't know. And it's like, Why? There's power in song, and there's power in community. I was looking at all types of Queen songs this week, and I mean, uh, We Will Rock You is just the weirdest set of lyrics. You've got mud on your face, you big disgrace. But it comes on, and everyone's like, let's go! Yeah! What is it? There's something powerful about music and something powerful about song in community. I think it's the genius of God to create it this way. And when he commands us, hey, get together. And when you're together, sing music, song, what God has done in your life, his character, his goodness, his story, his gospel, put it to music. Because certainly it is powerful in and of itself. But something happens when it's put to music. And something even greater happens when we're with other people, whether we know them or not, and we all of a sudden are together declaring the same truths. Something stirs inside of us, bonds us more closely to the God that we are worshiping, and bonds us more closely to the community that we're around. And there is so much power in why God tells us that we are to worship, not just to, you know, on our own, but to worship in community. If we look at uh, following up on verse 2, the end of verse 2, It says, don't just sing. It says, each day, proclaim the good news that he saves. Proclaim. This word means to to broadcast or to announce. It, it, It means some level of volume. This is not saying going along with a melody. This is saying like a, a, with volume, proclaiming, announcing, shouting the goodness of God. So one way verbally that we can express our worship to God is through singing. And now secondly, if you're taking notes, we can worship God verbally through shouting, through some level of announcing, some level of volume when we are declaring the goodness of God. Uh, Again, maybe this isn't the most comfortable for some people, but 30 times in the Psalms alone, we're told, commanded, that we are to verbally shout the goodness of God. Psalms 100 is maybe one of the most popular psalms behind Psalms 23, and it says, shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Shout for joy. It's something that we can know and memorize and recite, but it is actually a command of Scripture that when we see the joy and the delight of the gospel of God, that we would be a people that express that. Some level of volume would come out of us when we are declaring the truth of God and the gospel that we know. Um, maybe you've experienced something good that happens. And uh, when something good happens, sometimes it just, the emotion inside of us, the feeling inside of us, just has to be let out with some sort of volume, some sort of noise, some sort of reaction. Whether it's a word or not, something comes out of us. Whether it was you got the promotion, she said yes to the date, you 
got a victory royale on Fortnite. Like something comes out of us. Like, woo! Yes, like, so, like something comes out. I remember uh, just recently when our daughter, uh, we got an email that she made uh, a team that she tried out for in sports. When that happens and you read that and you, you're celebrating it with your daughter, it's not just a passive aggressive thumbs up, like good job. Like there's like, yes, we're so, like something comes out of you when there's good news that has been received, good news that has been heard, it pulls out expression from us. I wanna tell you and remind you that we have the best news. And when we come together and there's moments of public declaration of scripture and we're singing songs that are talking about how death has been defeated and our king is alive and we start rehearsing the good news that something is stirring inside of us and you've probably felt it. One way that we express in a worshipful way is some level of volume coming out of us, a responding to the good news. And let me remind you again that the good news of the gospel is the best news that any of us have ever received. That, that when we were dead in our sins and trespasses, we could not save ourselves. We could not work ourselves back into life. There was no hope. We were dead in our sins and trespasses. That we had a God who saw us and loved us so much that he sent his son that we could experience life through the gift of Jesus, that we could have hope and forgiveness in this life and we could have the abundance of eternity in him by not working for it, but by receiving in faith the good news that he's offered us. I don't know about you, but you start rehearsing and recalling where I was and where I ought to be and what my future should be because of who I am and recognizing the gift that I've been given, that that is wiped away, that there is no more sin, there is no more shame, that there is, there is only hope of joy and eternity ahead of me. When you start rehearsing the gospel, something stirs inside of us and be prepared that maybe you'll let out a little volume when you hear the gospel once again. This is part of how we worship God is through singing. And, and maybe it's not a lyric on the screen, but there's just some volume that comes out of us. On a bit of a side note, um, I don't think we ought to turn our worship off when the band exits the stage. Um, and I want to be clear on this. This is, um, this is not a preacher asking for affirmation. Uh, let's just say that up front. But I do believe that as the gospel is still being communicated by a preacher on a stage that we still participate in worship. That I believe that when we are engaging in the gospel and we are continuing to worship, even though it's not musical in this moment, we still have opportunities to worship through verbal responses while the preaching of the word is happening. Now, I've been in settings and in environments where it can get a little weird, where there's like organized, you need to stand up and cheer three times at service, and I'm not asking for any of this. It can get weird. But when we are responding verbally to the declaration of the gospel, we are not complimenting the preacher, we are worshiping our God. And if the verbal response is an admiration of God, it is something that we are expected and commanded to do in our lives. And a setting where that could be uh, relevant is in the preaching of the word of God. And I believe that um, there's so much power when there is verbal response, not just to the people around you or the guy that is talking, but something is even stirring inside of us when we vocalize an agreement or an admiration for the gospel. So please hear me. This is not asking you to compliment the preacher. This is saying, why don't we worship God in all the ways that he designed us to worship? Why don't we continue worship, not just in song, but in the declaration of the gospel? Let me uh, put it in, in, in this example. If someone has a positive opinion of you, they admire you, they think well of you, they're grateful uh, about some aspect of you, um, that's wonderful. What makes that so much more meaningful to you is when that person decides to express that to you. Like it's way more valuable than it just being kept on the inside is when that person looks at you and says, um, man, I really appreciate this about you. I look up to you because of this. When you did this, it meant so much to me. Uh, I just, they begin expressing admiration for you. It means so much more than them keeping it inside. What takes that admiration to a whole nother level of meaningfulness is when they're willing to express that, not in like a, a secretive, hey, can, can we go into this quiet place where nobody can hear what I'm about to tell you, but when they're willing to express that in front of other people. Like, I believe this about you. I feel this about you, and I don't care who hears or knows. Like, this, this means so much to me that I'm willing to even say this in a public setting. It makes that meaningfulness go up even more. What elevates it to an entirely nother level 
is when the other people that are around that moment, they start chiming in as well. Where the person says, hey, I admire this about you. Uh, I was so grateful when you did this. And someone else is like, oh, yeah, they did that for me too. I just love them. Like, oh, yeah, you're, my, you're the best. And all these other people start agreeing about the statements being made about you. It takes the meaningfulness of the moment to unbelievable heights where it could have just been kept inside, and that's nice. Or it takes all these steps where now there is a, a community of people in agreement about the statements that are being made. This is what heightens moments of worship. Now imagine there's somebody in this group who doesn't know the person being complimented, doesn't have a close relationship, but they hear these statements being said. And they hear that not just one person believes this about this person, but all these other people are chiming in and they've had similar experiences. The admiration of this person. What happens inside the one who's unfamiliar is a desire to know more. Or maybe I should be more like that because this sounds pretty amazing that all these friends like this about that person. That something becomes uh, desirable in the person who hears who maybe isn't familiar themselves. I'll tell you, when we worship, that, that ways to elevate and make more meaningful the admiration that we have for our God is certainly not to just keep it inside, but to get it on the outside, to speak it. Like it just means so much. And then speak it and sing it and shout it in front of other people. And then what makes it so amazing, not just when one person stands up and begins to declaring the truth of God, but when a community of people start nodding their heads and are engaged and like, yes, I, yeah, I, I recall how that is true in my life. And yet God is that to me. And, and we begin worshiping together, although one person is saying most of the words, we together are elevating what the worship of God in these moments is. And every week there's people around us who are distant from God. And yet there's an opportunity for us to all be a part of declaring the gospel to them when we are in agreement. It's not just one person who believes this, but we have all in community experienced God move in these ways. There's so much power when we continue worshiping after music and we worship through the responding to the message of the word of God. Psalms 96.3 goes on to say, publish his glorious deeds among the nations. Tell everyone the amazing things that he's done. So we go from singing to some sort of volume, some proclamation, and now it just simply says, just say it. Just tell the wonderful things that God has done so we can worship God verbally through just speaking. Point number three for note takers. We can worship or we can express the worthiness of God verbally by just using our words. For some of you, this is more your pace doesn't excuse you from one and two. You're still a part of all of the earth. But maybe this is where you really can find an opportunity for you to express God's worthiness with your mouth. It's simply talking about how good God is. And this isn't an unfamiliar concept to us. We worship all the time. We express the things that we like all the time, whether it's the shows that you've been watching or the athletes that you've been watching or the food you've eaten or the music you've listened to or the concert you went to or the coffee that you're drinking. Like we, we are people who just declare when something is good. And we have a God who is so good, who is constantly at work. And we have the opportunity to put into words that which we recognize he's done in our lives. I think first and foremost, the way that we can use our words in just speaking is we just tell him. Now, it doesn't, we're talking certainly larger than just our gatherings on Sunday morning where a band is leading us, but um, even considering those moments, what would it look like if during a time of corporate gathering right here and the band's playing a song and there's lyrics on the screen that you can follow along with, but what would it look like for you to just have this sense of the goodness of God in your heart and you just decide to go off script, and you're just sitting there, standing there in your spot, and you just start quietly declaring what is truest in your heart at the moment. It's like, yeah, the band's singing this, and everyone else is doing that, but I'm just gonna have this moment where, like, God, I just, this week this happened. Or I just, I look at the people that you've surrounded me with, I can see your hand at work in my life, and God, you're just, you're so good. You've given me hope when I didn't think I'd ever experience hope again. You carried me through what I didn't know how I was going to get to the other side of, or God, whatever it is, we just start saying, like, this is, this is who you are. This is what you've done. This is my gratitude. This is my admiration. And you can just, in 30 seconds, pour out the most genuine worship that isn't following along what someone else says would be a good thing for you to sing, but you have a moment of just telling God with your words the admiration you have for him. How beautiful that all across this room, 
we could have half of us singing this song, and there's so much power in communal song, and then there's half of us that are going totally off script and just declaring these small moments, these small statements of the goodness of God, how powerful these moments are in worship of him, and what begins to transition in our own hearts when we hear our own voices stating the truths of who God is and declaring his wonders that we see him doing in our lives. And then certainly it does relate to telling others. It says, tell everyone about the amazing things that he's done. What's it look like throughout the week, or if we want to continue just looking at our corporate gatherings, that when our time is over here, before you leave, what's it look like for you to just take a 30-second conversation of, hey, what's your name, man? It's so great to worship Jesus with you, or someone that you already know. Just say, hey, man, God's been so good to me this week. And you just let it out, and then you go about, like, there's so much power in speaking the goodness of God. I'm going to ask the band to join me, and we're going to conclude with a moment of application here uh, as the band joins us. But I want to challenge you, church, that these uh, these are simple teachings, but these are culture-creating concepts. Certainly church-wide, these are culture-creating concepts, but these are culture-creating concepts in your own life. When you choose to begin expressing the worthiness of God, and today, through these verbal expressions of song, of shouting, of speaking, something happens internally. Again, some of you need to hear your own voice speaking the truth of God. The voice you listen to and believe the most is your own. Some of you need to hear your own voice declaring his goodness. Some of you, you're going to create new culture because you're going to step out of your season of observation, which I get. But when you cross the line of moments like this being moments of observation to moments of engagement, you're going to experience the presence of God in such a new way. And it's going to create a new culture in your own relationship with him. That when you actually sing, or we're going to talk about some other concepts next week, but you sing or you raise a hand or you whatever it is and it's spirit and it's truth it's not forced and then you realize oh my goodness no one criticized me I won't even seem to notice like this is wow we're going a little higher next week it's going to start creating culture for you when you recognize oh this isn't about me this isn't about the way that I look this isn't about the way that I sound this isn't about my insecurities this is about a God who's so worthy And when I take the courage and the obedient step of engaging in expressing worship of him, I begin to realize more and more how little this has to do with me and how much this has to do with him and how his presence and how he responds to worship. Like I begin to experience him in new ways. This is creating new culture for you, for your home, for your marriages, for your kids. I do wanna say this is certainly also creating culture for our church. I wanna tell you just in a moment, briefly the the church that I see is a church that is not just having a statement that our values are prayer and worship but our culture demonstrates that we're a church that values prayer and worship that is is, it's, it's who we are not because we said it was going to be but because you look around and man these people pray these people declare the goodness of God they engage in worship this is not a place of observation it's a place of expression Uh, I say this not as criticism, but as vision. The church I see is a more expressive church than the church we see today. I love Anchor Church. I have no qualms with how we worship. I just sat here today just blown away by the team that God's allowed to lead us. The quality of the atmosphere. There's people singing and worshiping and and raising hands and clapping. Like I, I love Anchor Church as it is today. But the church I see has a more engagement in spirit and in truth. We're not gonna be, the church I see is not a weird church <laughs> that freaks people out because everyone's screaming and shouting and running around. That's not the church I see. But the church I see is when you show up to Anchor Church, you're in the game. We're not observers, we're not spectators. We have a God who has rescued all of us. Maybe I'm not musical or maybe I'm not a preacher, but man, I'm here to worship God just like everybody else because he's changed my life. 
The gospel's just as true to the person who's never played an instrument in their life as he is to, the, to, to Spencer leading us every week. The gospel's the same. And we get together and we, we recognize the worthiness of our God. And, and I gotta express it, I'm gonna sing, I'm gonna shout, I'm gonna speak, I'm gonna engage in these moments. It's the church that I see. The church I see has a line of people for our prayer team. And while you're waiting for someone to be available, you're worshiping in the aisles and in the moments. And because we understand the love that God has for you, how much he's engaged in the details of your life and what it means to be around a community of faith where you're not gonna worship, worship in isolation, although there's people around you, you're gonna worship in community. You're gonna go over, there's gonna be a line of people, I just wanna praise God today for what he did this week. And it's just a celebration over there under that banner. It's the church I see. There's culture that God has put inside of us that we're growing, we're building in. These last two years as a church have been beyond anything we could imagine. But we got years ahead of us and we're entering into a new year. And I just wanna tell you up front, I don't know what spirit and truth looks like for you. And I wanna be very clear, we are not asking and demanding that everyone expresses the same way. But what is true of you, we're gonna engage. We're here to worship a God who is worthy. If you're willing and able, would you stand with me? We're gonna dismiss in just a few minutes, but we have an opportunity right now to worship in spirit and in truth, sincere and orderly with all attention on the glory of our God. Jesus, we, uh, we love you. We're so grateful for who you are. We're so grateful for what you've done. We recall the good news of the gospel that is for us. And as we consider who you are, not how we feel, worship is the response. God, thank you that you've provided outlets for us to engage in these moments. Thank you for the beauty of song. Thank you for the beauty of song in community, the opportunity to have volume, the opportunity to just quietly speak the truths of who you are. God, thank you that you designed each person with personalities and expressions that are different than everyone else. And so we can worship you in a way that is so genuine to us and it's different than anyone else in all of creation, but it is special and it is unique and it is sincere between us and you. God, let us be a church that engages, that expresses the worthiness of our God. Let us not just be observers, but we would be people who declare who you are in spirit and in truth. We love you and we worship you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.